Um, well, the first thing to say, actually, is just that the title of this talk is Am I My Mine? Not that was a description, but there we are. I just wanted to thank Ray enormously for that very characteristically stimulating talk. Um, and uh, I'm going to pay him, I hope, what he will see as the compliment of sort of abandoning some of what I was going to say to address some of the things he was talking about. <laughs> um, and I hope that we'll, we'll get uh, 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 around to talking about what I thought I might talk about. Uh, I assumed that what we were really here to talk about was the relationship between personhood and a brain, or personhood and the mind. Um, and that was what I came equipped to talk about. Um, I very much hoped we wouldn't get onto the um, mind, body, or consciousness matter uh, problem. Um, I sort of hoped we wouldn't, but since you've been so um, suggestively interesting about it, I just thought I'd make a few reflections on that uh, treacherous topic. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to acknowledge your honesty in saying, you know, that you, you don't know the answers, and, I, and that is very helpful to me because I don't either. Um, and uh, I suppose, in a way, the whole thing could be summed up, really, uh, by just saying there is an unbridgeable rift between uh, the inwardness of experience and the outwardness of factual observation, and that, really, we come up against the limits of philosophy at that point. And although uh, it's quite true, there's a lot of, I thought it was very amusing what Ray had to say about the various kinds of hand-waving and so on, um, in a way, he can't, I think, avoid, if you don't mind my saying so, some sort of hand-waving too, because quite rightly he doesn't want to think of himself as a dualist, but he doesn't also think one can talk about levels or aspects of something, uh, because that's quite rightly presupposes consciousness, so it can't be an answer to the consciousness problem to frame it in that way. But as to what is the solution to this then, Ray is, I mean, very honestly silent. And I think that does, uh, if we don't want to just go, well, as philosophers we can't approach this, um, some sort of circumscribing of the area at any rate um, may let us le let what we can say stand in relief. Um, and I thought that um, on that topic, I don't know whether you like to call it panpsychism pan or, or what, but I, I imagine that, Ray, you will probably have read um, a, a, a paper by Galen Strawson um, in which he suggests that actually the only logical position on this is to accept a form of panpsychism and indeed there's a whole book by Christian De Quincey uh, who's an American analytical philosopher who from the analytical perspective reaches the same conclusion um, and if you have an unbridgeable divide between whatever it is that is inner experience and whatever it is that is the rest as it were that exists apart from our experience um, there's got to be a moment at which it comes in, or there's got to be a gradual process. And I think one of the things I identify in the way that you talked, Ray, was that you, there were sort of cut-off points which were pressed on by a number of speakers. You know, is this a gradual process, or is it something that just sort of happens with humans? And, of course, I know that you don't think that it, it does uh, just happen with humans. But on the other hand, there is a tendency to think of us as more distinct from animals. We, we, we disagree about this. Um, uh, and a tendency to, to sort of think of um, separate things, or that was an impression that came across. And I'm trying to think of a way around this. And one of the ways around it is suggest that there isn't just, as Dennett might say, or you might agree, all we can say is there is just this, uh, what did you call it, basic stuff. Um, I think the expression was nothing but stuff. Well, the trouble with stuff is it's a noun. And I think what I want to suggest is that our problem is partly in thinking about things and that I want to focus instead on the importance of process and relationship and that what it matters in our experience and everything, in fact, that exists even according to physics exists in relationships. And so this casts... A, a sort of different light on the idea of something 
emerging, supervening, or arising out of complexity, because it's really saying that patterns are more important than the things that constitute the pattern. And a rather striking example of this, to which we can all, uh, our bosoms all will return an echo, and which you will be talking about later this evening, is music, in which there's a handful of nothings. Everything is in the relationship. Those notes in themselves, doesn't matter how many of them you put together, a single note has no meaning at all. Music is entirely in the relationships that make melody, make harmony, make rhythm, and so on, and make up music. And indeed, poetry, I haven't got time to go into that today, but poetry has similar characteristics, uh, and so on. So, um, one possibility is that out of the complexity of arrangement of things, different patterns emerge. And so the, the, the question of what the stuff is is almost not, not, the, not the, the, the serious question. The serious question is, how is it arranged? Now, I'm going to get quickly retreat from the quicksands. I feel myself getting bogged down in this. Um, I, 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 I also think I just want to put in a word of um, defence for Colin McGinn here, because I think it's perfectly coherent to talk about the being constraints. Mm -hmm. And um, just that one is conscious of constraints doesn't mean to say that one has surpassed those constraints. One can be conscious of constraints that one cannot surpass. And indeed, one can tell from reflecting on evolution that a squirrel cannot know and perceive things that we think or know. Uh, at least that is very much an assumption behind your view that humans um, think and perceive differently from animals. So I doubt that you'll disagree about that. And so we, we know that uh, a brain can, or a, an organism, or a consciousness, can have its limitations. And so ours may too. We're not the pinnacle of evolution. Why would we think that? It's entirely an irrational assumption. Okay, so I'm going to talk instead about, um, we're going to skip that question in, in, in a fairly um, uh, clear way, because... What happens when you talk about persons and matter and brains and consciousness is that you are using your mind, you're using your consciousness. And indeed, the brain is just an idea. The, the, the primacy of consciousness was one thing that Descartes got right. Uh, and I agree entirely with, with Ray. Um, I was delighted to hear him say that the problem is not the problem of consciousness, but the problem of matter. What the dickens is matter? Matter is something we only know about through consciousness. We only are aware of, of um, the world through our minds. Um, the, the body is only perceivable and knowable and only exists for us to experience per the mind. And as far as we know, the mind only exists for us to experience per the body. So um, thinking of something that has different aspects, at least in our consciousness, is, I think, a legitimate uh, idea. Doctors um, love to uh, uh, impress people by um, re-describing phenomena. For example, um, there is a condition which is marked by um, red blotches of irregular shapes, um, which is known as erythema multiforme. What's this, Doctor? Oh, it's erythema multiforme. As you will know, erythema multiforme simply means irregular patches of red blotches. <laughs> uh, my, my particular fav favourite is polycythemia rubra vera, um, which, which is uh, characterised by a finding of excess red blood cells, and polycythemia rubra vera <laughs> means a real case of too many red blood cells. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, of course, uh, one seems to have done something. And it's slightly unfair because one has done something. One's recognised the pattern. Uh, perhaps that's an important point to just pause on there. One sees a pattern which one knows something about from other experience. But um, there is an awful lot of nonsense uh, talked about which Ray and I are absolutely in agreement, I, I believe. Uh, the sort of um, nothing buttery where... Um, you, you, you find the circuits that light up when you fall in love, and, you know, there was great excitement about that. Um, it, it was all over the papers, you know, and it was, a, it was of course, a huge relief, because until that point, I, I, I didn't know whether we really fell in love or not. <laughs> and, and recently, some, uh, a team in America uh, explored 
moral values. Very interestingly, they found, as I might have predicted, that when you suppress the right parietal, temporary parietal region, um, you're unable to understand moral judgments except in terms of um, uh, outcomes, consequentialism. And, um, and in, indeed, you become almost autistic. The example was um, uh, Grace intends to put sugar in her friend's coffee. Um, in fact, she puts poison in and the friend dies. In the second scenario, she intends to poison her friend. In fact, she puts sugar in and the friend lives, which is the more morally culpable. <laughs> well, most of us know that it's going to be the case in which she intended to poison, but when you take the right hemisphere out, you find that um, you think it was the, the case where you actually ended up by killing your friend. And um, uh, I'm not really here to debate that, but um, they made this uh, ponderous remark. If something as complex as morality has a mechanical explanation, it would be hard to argue that people have or need a soul. And it, it strikes me this, this whole line of argument is very reminiscent of those medieval witch trials. You remember, if you, um, if you were thrown into a river and you sank, you were innocent, but if you swam, you were a witch and were put to death. And the same thing happens, that if you look in the brain and you find no evidence of a soul, you say, well, there, there can't be such a thing as a soul. But if you go in there and find soul-like behavior in the brain, you say, there, there can't be such a thing as a soul. So you, you, it's a sort of um, um, uh, foolproof way of discrediting anything uh, above the level of the purely re reduced material. Now, I think the problem here is asking the right questions. What questions can we ask of science legitimately? And I think we can't ask existential questions, such as whether love, consciousness, or a god exist, nor what kind of thing they might be. These are all experiential questions. But we can ask questions of mechanism, its structure and function, the how is it done uh, kind of question. So when we come to look at the mind, the brain, and the person, um, I'm, I'm not in favor of the idea that somehow, you know, we're controlled by this exciting machinery up there. Um, I'm against the idea of separation. And um, I wanted here to quote uh, a, a remark by Dewey. Um, to see the organism in nature, the nervous system in the organism, the brain in the nervous system, the cortex in the brain, is the answer to the problems which haunt philosophy. And when thus seen, they will be seen to be in, not as marbles are in a box, but as events are in history, in a moving, growing, never finished process. Once again, the idea of a process, which is a description of the various events, which are the things um, that go to make up history, but are not the sum of history. History is greater than just the sum of the events. And those American pragmatists are always a good source of wisdom. I think I'd like to remind you of something that William James said. We conceive a concrete situation by singling out some salient or important feature in it and classing it under that. Now that might be in this case, what is the person? The brain, let's see is that one. Then, instead of adding to its previous characters all the positive consequences which that new way of conceiving it may bring, we proceed to use our concept privatively, reducing the originally rich phenomenon to the naked suggestions of that name abstractly taken, treating it as a case of nothing but that concept, and acting as if all the other characters from out of which the concept is abstracted were expunged. Abstraction, functioning in this way, becomes a means of arrest far more than a means of advance in thought. It mutilates things. It creates difficulties and finds impossibilities. And more than half the trouble that metaphysicians and logicians give themselves over the paradoxes and dialectic puzzles of the universe may, I am convinced, be traced to this relatively simple source. The viciously privative employment of abstract characters and class names is, I am persuaded, one of the great original sins of the rationalistic mind. And that's quite a complicated passage, but because it's terribly good and terribly important, I made some very, very simple slides. <laughs> so here is a person in blue, and there's the brain residing in it, not as a marble in a box, as Dewey says, but 
as an element in the history of the person and the whole context of the person. So not interchangeable with the person, but not disconnecting from the person either. Now when you take it out and say it's the brain, you have forced a separation and you've, you've done what, what, he's, what he calls vicious abstractionism, which is you've taken this idea out and now it becomes nothing but the brain because of this habit of thinking whereby we deprive it of all the qualities it had when it was in a person, <laughs> i.e. part of a multiply complex and unimaginably, unfathomably complex being, and instead turn it into a, a bit of a machine. There's that blob. How can that possibly be me or responsible for my thoughts? In other words, the brain gets reduced to being a bit of a computer, and of course it's a no-brainer that that is not a person. But what he's saying is that there is this whole person, and that whole person's qualities are also present in the brain if you don't viciously abstract it, if you don't deprive it of those other meanings. And <laughs> so then you get another kind of absurdity, which is really saying, well, the brain is the totality. But, of course, that's not the only alternative, that the brain is the one that falls in love. Of course, it's the person that falls in love. Uh, that, about that, Ray and I uh, are entirely in agreement. Um, and this, which I'm not sure has come out very well, is really to show that the brain and the person are at different levels of description, if you like, of a multiply complex phenomenon that is done violence to when you strip bits out. So, in a way, it depends on the plane of attention that we have to the being that is a human being, what it is exactly that we see. And um, materialists who just focus on matter um, are in a bit of a quandary, really. I mean, they're not people, as I always say, who overestimate matter. They're people who underestimate matter, because if really they are sincere that everything is material, they've got to account for how that matter, after a few million years, gives rise to the B minor mass. To help make this a little bit more concrete, um, this is the mountain behind my house on Skye, where I was unbelievably yesterday. Um, and its name in, in Norse was Talisgar. It's uh, now called Talisgar. And uh, the name means the sloping rock. And this is because the um, Norse men who came down and discovered this region of Scotland um, used that rock as a landmark for navigation. So they saw the mountain as a shape that meant uh, security or danger. But there are almost infinite numbers of ways of thinking about this mountain. When the Picts came to live there a couple of thousand years ago, they saw this rock as being the home of the gods. When 19th century travellers started, or in fact 18th century travellers started coming and sketching the area, they saw this mountain as a beautiful coloured and many textured form. A speculator who wants to rip out its columns of basalt sees it as a source of wealth. If you ask a geologist what this mountain is, he will describe those basaltic columns. But if you talk to his colleague, a physicist, he will say, well, there's 99.9% .9 of it is space, and there are various probabilities <coughs> of the existence of particles we don't understand. Um, whizzing around. Now, these are all perfectly legitimate ways of thinking about or perceiving or conceiving a mountain. But none of them is definitively the mountain. What makes a difference is attention. But there's nothing wrong with having the kind of objective attention that uh, science brings to the world. In fact, it's an extremely helpful position. The only problem with it is it when it comes to see itself as the omnipotent one, the one that understands and knows everything and can give the answers to all the questions. It's simply yet another way of thinking about the world which privileges a certain kind of abstraction and detachment which is very useful 
in a certain context for finding out certain kinds of things. But it can't be any more than another, the true picture of uh, the mountain. Now, the same thing applies mutatis mutandis, not just to mountains, but to everything that exists, including people. Now, one of the problems that you get when you start breaking the world up into bits and taking things out of their context is you have a problem of causation. Because once you've got that brain and that person, you've got the problem is, well, what, what's controlling what? What's, what's causing what in this relationship? Does the person somehow conceive things out of the ether and these things are then transmitted to the brain which faithfully executes them for that person's will? Or is the brain directing the show? But each of these is an improbable situation because it's a misunderstanding of causation in relation, I would suggest, to highly complex organic context. You can, by simplifying things, you can, you can have a machine model in which causation plays a part. But once you abandon the machine model, you find that the, the stridency of that question about causation is to a large degree abated. So I'm going to make just a few reflections on causation. A river is water. In a way, that's all it is, plus or minus some fish or plants and so forth. But the river is formed by a landscape. So does the landscape cause the river? No, it just constrains the water, and the river is a result. And only circumstance, the rest of the world, can constrain that water to make a river and finally a waterfall. This is the waterfall in, at the bottom of my garden. And, um, and you might say, well, is that, is that just water? Well, in a way it is, but it's also a waterfall. And what about that? Is that just water? That's more complicated. It's ice. But where's the water? In the ice? No. The water is the ice in another phase, in another way of being, or another way of, um, yes, being. And I've often thought that we have an odd view about causation. You know, a bat striking a ball is the simplest possible example, and there you really are dealing with something very mechanical. But even that is not entirely straightforward. It does necessitate the ball flying off suddenly at great speed in a certain direction, but equally the ball flying off suddenly from the bat at great speed in a certain direction necessitates the bat striking it in a certain way. One could say the bat and ball have a certain stickiness, a tendency for their movements to cohere in a certain kind of context. So I would say it's crazy to deny that brain and body constrain mind, not just in the case of pathology, but in the case of our capacity to perceive, and I would argue, to conceive the world. I want to say a bit more about the idea of constraint, because I think it's quite important. What the body and a fortiori the brain permits is what we are able to experience. It doesn't have to cause it. In fact, I don't think it does cause it. I think it shapes it, moulds it, as the landscape forms the river through the constraints that it applies. Um, it will allow us to be in contact with some things and not others, and to be able to make sense of them or not. And uh, I mean, this is very obvious when, of course, something attacks um, the body or the brain. Um, you know, by studying objectively hearing and sight, we know that the other animals can hear and see things that we can't. Um, and so that suggests to us that even in the normal circumstance, our senses have limits to them. That's a fairly obvious point. And they can, those limits can be advanced by doing certain things, like standing too close to an artillery battery or just getting old. Um, so from science we know that there are sounds we can't hear, but we didn't make a fuss about whether the ear was the one that was hearing or the person was the one that was hearing. In a way, these are manners of speech or levels of description. And when we talk about the brain, I think we are into the same territory that the brain 
the normal brain will constrain us to, to be able to understand or perceive certain things and not others, and pathology advances it in certain ways. And we can also use it because of circumstance. The feedback from the environment may encourage us to use our brains in certain quite specific ways that otherwise we wouldn't have necessarily been doing. So embodiment is a very important part of what it is that we are. I mean, addressing the question, are we the, our minds? Again, like Ray, I can give a simple answer, no. <laughs> uh, and by the way, I agree entirely with Ray that we're just not our brains as well. Um, but the body is the context in which the mind has to be understood. Um, and I, I hope you, uh, like me, fans of a book called Philosophy in the Flesh by Lakoff and Johnson, um, I think they make a very, very good argument that all our manners of thinking, particularly in science and philosophy, come back to images and metaphors that are rooted in the body. And we cannot, as it were, go beyond those metaphors and experiences because they are the bedrock out of which our conceptions arise. They say what disembodied realism misses is that as embodied imaginative creatures, we never were separated or divorced from reality in the first place. What has always made science possible is our embodiment, not our transcendence of it, and our imagination, not our avoidance of it. But I think there is a tendency in philosophy to overvalue what is obvious rather than latent. At least there has been in the tradition of Western philosophy between Socrates and Kant. And since then, in philosophers that we spoke of earlier, Hegel and Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, of course, one thinks particularly in, of in connection with the body, they have been much better at teasing out things that are latent knowledge, but when stared at directly, although perfectly real, tend to disappear. Um, there was an interesting paper recently on the Mona Lisa showing her en enigmatic smile and showing that when you stare at the face, you can't see the smile. But as soon as you look very slightly to the side, you're aware of the smile. There are things that one perceives by not looking directly at something. And uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, who, of course, is almost synonymous with the idea in philosophy of the importance of the body, and who actually studied neurology, in fact, in order to, and frequented the neurology wards in order to understand this relationship better. He said, it is being that speaks in us, not we that speak of being. This is a bit like Heidegger saying language speaks in us, not we who speak language. And I think what they're getting at is that we are not just our conscious minds. There is much in our history transmitted to us, possibly genetically, um, possibly by other mechanisms, through parenting and so forth, but in, certainly through our entire history, through our experience, what is unconscious, what is... Um, what has changed in our bodies through our, our experience that is the important part of everything that we are and know. And that is not our minds in the ordinary way that we use it. I mean, one of the, one of the rightly pointed out by somebody that this is a difficult area because some people speak as though the unconscious is part of the mind. And, of course, that's, in my view, that is a perfectly tenable position. But then the whole body would have to be part of the mind because the rest of the body is unconscious and it's not disconnected from the brain and its messages are constantly being received unconsciously outside the field of awareness. And, of course, in our time, of Freud was the great champion of, of this idea of the importance of the unconscious, although I think that there are ways in which he uh, spoke a bit reductionist, in a reductionist way about this. Um, but music and the other arts, like literature, also uh, let us know that we can really only understand things when we stop trying to understand them directly, analytically, and allow them to speak through us, uh, in us, at levels which are below consciousness and are thoroughly embodied, um, embodied. And I think it's worrying the way in which we're becoming a purely cerebral and abstract culture. Well, purely is a too strong a term, of course, but... We're increasingly um, uh, abstracted from uh, embod the, the embodiment, embodiment that our ancestors would have experienced simply through um, the ways in which we've cushioned ourselves, cocooned ourselves and surrounded ourselves 
by things that cut us off from such experiences. And um, Spinoza says the more capable the body is of being affected in many ways and affecting external bodies in many ways, the more capable of thinking is the mind. So that embodied nature is a very important part of our, our personhood, uh, not just the mind uh, as philosophers tend to use the term. There are also problems, I feel, with the whole business of theorizing, and in a way that was what I was getting at when I said that, in a way, part of the problem with the discussions we're having about the mind-body problem is we're trying to articulate this in a way which is fruitless. I think that's really what Colin McGinn was getting at, and it's actually what Wittgenstein himself hinted at. Um, by the way, Wittgenstein also said that the human body is the best picture of the human soul, so um, he was clearly not averse to the idea that we understand things that are intangible through their, uh, as aspects or um, other uh, appearances or levels of understanding of a unified whole rather than separate uh, entities. I think there are problems with theory, and I'm going to say a few words in praise of imprecision. Um, uh, A.N. Whitehead in Nature and Life, the sharp-cut scientific classifications are essential for scientific method, but they're dangerous for philosophy. Such classification hides the truth that the different modes of natural existence shade off into each other. And again, also from Nature and Life, this sharp division between mentality and nature has no ground in our fundamental observation. We find ourselves living in nature. Now, I agree with um, Ray that really the task of understanding as the task of criticizing, the task of creating, is one of clearing away. And in the case of understanding, clearing away misunderstanding. We don't put together an understanding by taking bits and adding them up and making a sequence. But we, our role is to clear away the dross that obscures the vision of whatever it is that we can't articulate. Often not saying precisely what something is, because we have no term for it, we encourage the mind to go beyond its normal constraints in language, to find its own passage by not so much forcing it through the water as steering it clear of the rocks. Thus, often it's impossible to be precise, and oddly not being precise is truer to the nature of the object than bogus precision. I often think of this with these algorithms and forms one has to fill out where one ticks a box if one thinks this or that or the other. And there's never a box from my point of view. <laughs> and um, one wants to say, but in what context and to what degree and so on and so forth. And actually, you know, to have an algorithm for the treatment of a patient, it sounds very scientific and it sounds precise. But actually what it guarantees is that it will never be a proper fit for any human individual because every individual is actually different. And so there's a sort of bogus precision that is embedded in a certain way we now think. That if you've got numbers for it, we've somehow been more true to its nature. And indeed, Einstein famously said that the laws of mathematics, in as much as they apply to the real world, are uh, not precise. And uh, in as much as they're precise, they don't apply to the real world. <laughs> and similarly, there are tensions between the rational pursuit of certainty and the desire for knowledge. <coughs> Since, as Hegel pointed out, immediacy, which is to say the the quality of being understandable without the need for any other concept or, or idea is not compatible with determinacy and hence certainty is purchased at the expense of content. The more certain our knowledge, the less we know. And when we theorize about this, we tend more to have to make a decision. That's one of the points about a certain way of thinking. Um, that you, you have to decide, is it this or is it that? And if you feel you can't, then you feel you failed. But actually, of course, like many things in life, we need a degree of messiness. Um, as the law gets more and more precise, it gets less and less good law. Um, there's a problem here. Um, we need to get messiness back into the legal system. Um, after all, in the past, cases would be treated differently because they were treated on their uh, 
merits. But people didn't like that in case inequality came in. But then you get the problem that the same thing is handed out in totally different concepts to different kinds of people. You can't, you're, you're between the scylla of the one and the charybdis of the other. And this is very clear in healthcare provision. You know, because for a long time everybody wanted to get rid of the heavy hand of central government and have local communities decide what kind of health care was provided for their community. And then as soon as that happened, it was a postcode lottery, you see, because if you lived in one area, you got a different treatment from somewhere else. But actually, logically, these are, the, these are going to be the sort of choices you have. So there are different layers, different aspects resulting from different modes of attention, and theory forces unnecessary distinctions. Now, wh what is a, a, a person? Well, you know this famous picture. Um, and, okay, at one level it's very funny and clever, um, it's not a pipe, but actually there is a sort of agreement that we understand the whole thing about a pipe from seeing this picture. And in a way, where does this business end? What is a person? For example, this is, <laughs> this, is, this is not really my friend Raymond. Um, it's a picture of him, but even if he was there in front of me, is that the person, or is it just an aspect of him that I'm seeing? It, funnily enough, as I arrived, Ray um, came to greet me with a very friendly remark, I saw your dorsal aspect. And I thought, well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you saw my dorsal aspect. You didn't see the person. Because the person is a very complex thing, and we can get caught out by being too pedantic. You know, one of the things that it has been said uh, about a book I wrote called The Master of His Emissary is that I, I talk as though the brain is like a person. But I'd rather talk about it like a person than like a machine. And those actually are our, our only alternatives. We haven't got a language for this. Um, the, the, the language of t feeling, thinking, talking, and so on is an everyday uh, language which is enormously subtle and complex and, and many textured and grew up out of everyday life. The, the, the language we have for the brain is just too crude. It's the language of science. So one, if one doesn't want to turn it into a machine, which is something one would have thought that a non-reductionist like myself and like Ray would approve of, then one has to talk as if there is a person here. And this argument about how you do, how you think about the brain, interestingly illustrates a point in the Master and His Emissary. So I'm going to try in about 10 minutes to very, very quickly give you a, an enormously sort of like the bluffer's guide to the master in his emissary. And this is not out of disrespect to you, it's out of respect to the fact that dinner's coming up and you'll probably forgive me. And also, that if you want to find out more, there is um, a book which I did um, earlier. Now, um, <laughs> I'll come back to why I think this uh, illustrates the point. Um, I, I just want to go back to a couple of slides here. So, uh, yes, no, uh, this is not about how the brain um, somehow is us or controls us. But um, basically this became a very toxic topic. No serious scientist would even countenance talk about difference between the hemisphere. It's partly snobbery because um, it was an idea that had got into popular culture and no philosopher or scientist likes to think that their mystery has been sort of broached by the the vulgar, uh, popular uh, 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 um, crowds. And, um, of course, there was also this terrible phenomenon of advertising and management courses, so it just became entirely toxic. And um, it was indeed career death to approach this area. Um, human scientists just knew that there was no difference. Um, uh, and I discovered um, they uh, didn't uh, need to uh, find this out by the usual method, which is having a look at the evidence. They just knew it. God had transmitted this information to them. However, the animal ethologists had been doing what scientists are supposed to do, which is actually look um, and observe and see what happens. And in fact, for 30 years, there had been um, a, a very interesting and very rich um, vein of research into animals, showing that they use their right and left hemispheres differently, and indeed... Um, this is of evolutionary advantage. The point is that um, you need to survive 
Sorry, th th those things there were really just to, for those of you who don't know what a brain looks like, just to show, show this sort of rather interesting point that it is actually divided. You know, why is it divided? Brain does, brains are supposed to be making connections. That is actually what a brain is. It's a mass of connections. And it, on the face of it, having a divide in the middle is a great loss of computing power. But I never heard anyone in medical school, in fact, I never heard anyone in my life ask the question, why is it divided? Um, embryology is not a good answer for all sorts of reasons, which um, uh, will probably be obvious to you, but if they're not, I can answer. But it's a pretty much a non-starter, because in every way, the two... This, uh, I'm not going to go into the detail on this, but the two halves of the brain are different. They are reliably different sizes, they're different weights, they're different shapes, they are different uh, sulcogyral patterns on the surface, they have different <coughs> cytoarchitecture in places, they use... Um, different uh, neuroendocrine hormones. They use different neuro or they respond differently to neuroendocrine hormones. They use different preponderances of neurotransmitters. They even have different greater weight ratio. And what every clinician knows, if you have a stroke in, or a, an insult in one half of the brain, it's not just the sight but the side that makes the difference to what actually happened. And what actually happens is not just like a bit going missing in the washing machine, but something actually changes in that whole person's world, that personhood changes in a very interesting way. Or in a, in a whole host of very interesting ways depending on what the injury is. Um, essentially the point uh, in evolution is this. There's a, a bird or, or an animal that is feeding has to be able to focus its attention very narrowly on something in order to be able to grasp it, to get that, uh, in this case, insect or pick up a seed from a background of uh, grit or pebbles on which it might lie or pick up a twig to build a nest. It's got to have very precise, narrowly focused attention. But if it only has that, it will not survive because at the same time it's got to be providing the exact opposite kind of attention which is broadly open, vigilant, uncommitted, sustained attention for anything and everything else that's going on. Because otherwise, while it's getting its lunch, it becomes somebody else's. So um, this was the idea that you had these two kinds of attention, but they, are, they construct different worlds in the brain, in the mind, uh, in, the, in the human's experiential mind. And we're not aware that this is the case, because the alternation and the fusion of these two takes on the world goes on at a level below consciousness. Uh, there's a control center in the midbrain which, which, which is tasked with doing this process. And we wouldn't know about it by introspection. So here I think that philosophers like Peter Hacker, who say we can't learn anything, a philosophy can't learn anything from science, are wrong. Because there are things one can know about oneself which one couldn't know by the pure process of introspection. And those things often have philosophical um, consequences. Um, on the other hand, this is the right hemisphere's attention, which is really seeing not just um, a linear connection between this thing that I'm going to get and uh, me and my target, as it were, but between the whole complexly interrelated uh, world uh, full of friends and foes. And it, so you can imagine if you've got very small, um, highly concentrated, very precise bits of information and you've got another uh, sustained, uncommitted attention, you will have different uh, uh, takes or, or, or um, yes, uh, takes on the world is a reasonable phrase. Now, um, what are those differences? Well, one is that the left hemisphere is, its raison d'etre in a way, is to narrow things down to a certainty. It's no good hesitating if you're in pursuit of something, is it or isn't it, you've got to just go for it, and you may miss, but that's, that's fine. So it tends to be concerned with getting things precise and getting them clear. The right hemisphere is more concerned with opening up to possibility, and Ramachandran actually calls it the devil's advocate, because it's the one that is saying, well, maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. And since most of the things that matter to us are ambivalent and implicit and very hard to pin down, um, having to decide whether this is a duck or a rabbit is, is not helpful. It's obviously not a question that can be, can be answered. Another consequence is the attention that fixes something outside the flow of time and outside of the context in which it inheres, um, will see things as made up, including things that actually flow and change, like 
human bodies, which are, as Navalis said, like a living river. The bits that are in the body, none of them were there so many years ago, but the form of the body, I hope, um, uh, really, it changes, but it is recognizably still me that's inhabiting the body. Um, worse luck. So <laughs> there is a difference between the way in which you see things as made up of lots and lots and lots of little bits um, and the idea of a flowing um, force. And the, uh, I here refer to uh, that um, underrated philosopher, Csikszent Mihai, who if he had a name like Freud would be a much more famous person, but I think nobody knows how to pronounce him. But his, his work has clarified the importance of things that flow um, in the nature of our experienced world. And in fact, in cases of people who have uh, almost always lesions in the right parietal occipital lobe, um, the world can seem like this, broken up uh, like a juddering cinefilm cine made out of a number of stills rather than a single flowing motion. Um, it also prioritizes the parts over the whole. And because um, our articulate argument constructing left hemisphere um, thinks that that uh, describes the process whereby we understand things, as I first understood this, then I understood that, and I put them together, we have the idea that we take the world in in that way. We see something, we put all the bits together. But in fact, we know we don't. We have a take on it initially, which may be, have to be corrected, but it's instantaneous, and we afterwards focus on the things that are important to us. And this is called a hierarchy of attention. This famous picture, how many people have seen this picture before? Yes, okay. I mean, for those of you who haven't, it's a Dalmatian dog. I don't know if I can make this thing. Yes, yes there is its nose, there's its ear the back, the tail, hind leg, foreleg, two paths that cross in the shade of a tree. I think I did hear an aha moment. That aha moment corresponds with activity in the superior temporal sulcus uh, in, the, in the right hemisphere. Uh, it isn't caused by uh, that, but it's associated with it. Um, and this really just illustrates the hierarchy of attention. Most people see first an H and then a four, and afterwards they see the E's and the the eights, and we don't build it up from the parts. There is a, an exception to that, which is in schizophrenia. So if anybody saw the E's and the eights, um, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> um, no, there are other, please don't worry about it, there are other possibilities. Um, just to illustrate how difficult it is for somebody who has damage to the right hemisphere to be able to relate the parts to a whole. If you ask them to draw an elephant, they'll draw a trunk, and then they'll draw an ear, and then they'll draw a foot. There's an elephant. But if you see here, these, the, the, I just want to focus, we haven't very much time, the one in the middle is a bicycle. Okay? And you see, here are the um, wheels, and here's the pedal. And both in terms of the size and the relationship between the parts, all you can say is this person knew that a bicycle was something that has wheels and has pedals, but quite how they relate as a form didn't know. Um, the right hemisphere alone is the one that enables us to understand implicit meaning. So when people have damage to the right frontal lobe, they tend to be unable to understand implicit meaning. And what a disadvantage this is in life is only um, apparent if you've ever met somebody who has this, because you realize how much of what you say is uh, not really in the explicit utterance. It's in the manner in which it was said, the tone of voice, the irony, the humor, which can reverse, of course, the meaning of something completely. And it's in what is unsaid and in the facial expression and the body language, all of which implicit understanding is much better accomplished, accomplished by the right hemisphere than the left. The left tends to take jokes seriously. And I, I found, actually, that when I was working in the neuroimaging lab at Hopkins, I had one or two problems on this level. I, in my first few weeks, I thought things were going all right, apart from one problem I had, which was whenever I said something, people would look at me in a rather puzzled way and go, really? And then I'd say, no, not really, but never mind. And um, <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, so, uh, the, because it's taking things, as it were, as and something, or oh, another one of those, because it sees that and sees that, it tends to abstract things from the context in which they inhere. And 
you know, again, absolutely crucial point emphasized again in the philosophy of Dewey, but really essential to any human understanding of the world is how context changes everything. And I could give a whole lecture on that topic and sometimes do, but I'm sure I don't need to in this audience. And it tends to look to the general qualities, not to those that are um, the unique marks of the individual uh, person or individual object. Uh, in fact, there's a rather touching example of a Swiss farmer who had a right temporary parietal stroke. And afterwards, he could tell his limousin from his Charolais, but he couldn't tell uh, Daisy from Tinkerbell or whatever Daisy and Tinkerbell are in Schweizerdeutsch. Um, so, and um, the right hemisphere is interested in the fine qualities of difference between things, whereas the left is more interested in aggregating them to find out how much of whatever it is we've got going. Um, and interestingly, the, there's a in difference here in their attitude to themselves. And this was first discovered um, in the 1970s when uh, neurosurgeons, before operating for epilepsy, uh, would sometimes want to know, before they went into the brain, how wide their excision could afford to be by t finding out which uh, hemisphere is the speaking hemisphere. And you may know that in um, language is a much more complicated thing. The old thing about language being in the left hemisphere is, is wrong. Some aspects of language certainly are. Um, the bits that make precise reference, but a lot of the rest of the meaning is actually in the right hemisphere. But speech, in right hand, there's 97% <laughs> of cases it's in the uh, left hemisphere, but in 3% even of right handers it's in the right hemisphere. And in left handers it's 60% and 40%, 60% in the left hemisphere, 40% in the right. And um, so uh, when they were doing this procedure, they would be uh, wanting to isolate one hemisphere preoperatively, which is done by uh, injecting sodium amytal into the carotid artery, and for about 15 minutes, only one hemisphere of the brain is properly working. And um, some clever neuropsychologists thought, well, this is a good opportunity to find out a bit more about these hemispheres. So we'd asked um, them to fill out a personality inventory about uh, uh, the person to fill out a, a personality inventory about himself or herself while undergoing this procedure. And these questionnaires were then given also to friends and family of the, of the person to fill out about the, the subject. And they found that when they got the results that the left hemisphere condition person uh, had a very high opinion of himself compared with what other people thought. And, uh, but the right hemisphere had a slightly lower opinion but was much more realistic. And this is the reason why it's very hard to rehabilitate people after a uh, left hemisphere stroke. And you think that for most people that means loss of their right hand, loss of speech. But actually, because the right hemisphere is so important actually to understanding the human world, but also to understanding the nature of your limitations and accepting them, it's harder to rehabilitate people with the left hemisphere stroke than people with the right hemisphere stroke. And you can see this very dramatically on a ward, and I'm sure Ray has seen this many a time. Somebody comes in the night having had a, a, uh, a right hemisphere stroke and they paralysis of the left arm. You come and see them in the morning and say, how are you feeling? I, I'm fine, thank you very much. So well, that's very good. Um, any problems? No, 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 no. Um, well, uh, any specifically with your left arm? No, none at all. Could you move it for me? And they go, there. And you say, well, I didn't see anything move. Did you see anything? No, no, no. We didn't see anything move. Would, would you mind? And you bring it right round in front of them and say, there, move that. And they go, oh, that? That belongs to the bloke in the next bed. <laughs> so, th but these are not people who are psychotic. They are actually unwilling to accept that they have um, constraints, limitations, and problems. Now, um, just for, um, uh, oh yes, a very important difference, I'm running up against time here, is the difference between um, things as they are present and as they become represented as an idea of themselves in the brain. One way of putting this is that in the right hemisphere, things present, in the left they are literally represented. And Elkin and Goldberg, um, a famous American neuroscientist, did um, a whole decade of research really showing that um, experiences of all kinds are preferentially processed in the right hemisphere, but as they become familiar and become, as it were, an icon of themselves, they, were, um, they engage more the attention of the left hemisphere. <laughs>
So, um, and this is just to make this a bit more practical. Uh, here you have um, drawings by people in three states. On the left, the intact person in the middle with their um, uh, right hemisphere inactivated and on the left with their left hemisphere inactivated. And you can see that in the middle, where there's only the left hemisphere working, things have become very shrunken uh, whereas on, and, and symbolic, really, that tree, whereas on the right you see something that has the living flow and form of a tree. Uh, this is the same with flowers, geometric symbols according to the left hemisphere, but the right hemisphere's ones are more like sort of plants as we know them, living things. Um, I'll skip over that one. And this is really just to draw your attention, we haven't got time, to the this column about what a person has become uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the left hemisphere's take on, on life. Now, I have a, a theory, which is not that the brain has evolved in some curious way and is controlling us, um, uh, but that when we come to, when we come to conceptualize a, and do what philosophers do and stand back and think about the world, we are forced to become more explicit that is the whole exercise. We're forced to have a coherent body of beliefs about the world. But the trouble is, we may find that the world is not as simple as the coherences we'd like to impose on it suggest. And we're more prepared to sacrifice reality than we are to sacrifice um, coherence. And so we end up with a world that is very, very limited in... If we start thinking like this, we, we constrain the way in which we perceive the world to be more like the world that the left hemisphere has, because the left hemisphere um, uh, is the one that privileges internal consistency. A very nice piece of research by um, uh, um, Marcel Kinsborn and a, a Russian colleague where they ask people to look at syllogisms, and this is one company in which I don't have to tell you what a syllogism mm -hmm. is. And, um, but the syllogism had a twist. One of the premises was false. So, for example, um, the porcupine is a monkey uh, was one of the false lines. And the syllogism went, all monkeys climb trees, that's true. The porcupine is a monkey, that's clearly false. The porcupine climbs trees. Is it true or not? Well, actually, between you and me, very annoyingly, there are porcupines that climb trees. But, <laughs> but the Russian experimenters and their subjects didn't know that, so just put that out of your mind. Now, when they, they asked these people to look at this in three... To, to give the answer, is this syllogism true, in three conditions. One intact, two left hemisphere only, and three right hemisphere only. And to cut a long story short, it was very consistent across the various subjects and different syllogisms. And what happened was that in the normal state, the person says, no, this is uh, nonsense, the porcupine's not a monkey, um, it's prickly, it runs on the ground. Then in the left hemisphere only situation, the same person, so not a different individual, this is the di same person on a different day, says, yes, it's true. And the examiner says, but why? Don't you know the porcupine's not a monkey? And she sort of looks a bit faced, but says, yes, but it's still true. Why? Because that's what's written on this piece of paper. And then when you go to the right hemisphere, that says indignantly, rather like the, the whole brain state, can't be right because the porcupine's nothing like a monkey. So, I mean, I know that a, these are two different ways of thinking about truth, and they both have a kind of validity. One is internal coherence to a system. The other is looking out of the window and finding out what actually happens. And I'm suggesting that we're moving more and more into a world which is constrained by this belief that we must be consistent with a set of propositions and anything that doesn't fit is just cut off. Rather, as Ray was saying, if it doesn't fit your theory, consciousness can't be fit. You just say, well, it's an illusion. Well, nothing could be more um, uh, irrational than to suppose that consciousness, which is what, is your, what you're using to reach that conclusion, is an illusion. But if we were, this is what we would find. We'd find generally a loss of the broader picture. We'd find knowledge replaced by information, tokens or representations, ticking boxes. Loss of the concepts of skill and judgment, which are embodied and individual and far too unpredictable. Um, bureaucracies like things like algorithms, which a machine could follow. Again, matter and mind need to be amphibiously aspects of the same thing. And if you sunder them by saying it's got to be either this or that, as the left hemisphere would prefer, you get abstraction on the one hand and reification, lump and matter on the other.
bureaucracy would have a field day because according to Peter Berger, who's a famous uh, sociologist, these are the features of it and they are all features favoured by the left hemisphere's take on the world. There'd be a loss of the sense of uniqueness. Um, a quantity would become the only criterion. We'd be forced to uh, make decisions uh, in a black and white way. Reasonableness is not the same thing as rationality. In German there are two different words. Verstand is rationality and Vernunft is, is reason, which is a, a complex, subtle com concept, which is an amalgam of experience with the ability to think clearly. And um, there'd be a general failure of that very uncommon, uh, these days, thing, common sense. Systems would be designed simply to maximise utility. Morality, in fact, would be seen in terms of utility. There'd be a loss of social cohesion, because this is to do with the right hemisphere's empathic skills. Um, uh, psychopaths have problems in their right ventral medial frontal cortex. Um, there'd be a paranoia and lack of trust, because the whole point of the left hemisphere is to be able accurately to control well, things and grasp them, and things that are not under its control are dangerous, and it uh, would therefore be in favour of continuously monitoring things, perhaps with CCTV cameras, perhaps even having a database of the entire population. <laughs> and and the, in general, there'd be a need for total control. Also, the left hemisphere is not as you know, commonly thought of, very cool and rational. In fact, both are emotional. Both are involved in absolutely everything, which is why the old ideas about the right hemisphere and left hemisphere went out of the window. But the one, one uh, uh, emotion that lateralizes most clearly is anger, and it lateralizes to the left. Um, we would see ourselves as the passive victims of others' doings. Art would become conceptual. I haven't got time to go into these particular aspects, but the right hemisphere is the one that understands perspective, which, by the way, we have found and lost in three civilizations, the Greek, the Roman, and then again in 15th century Florence. And um, music would be reduced to little more than rhythm, which is the bit of music which the left hemisphere, in most people, is equipped to understand rather than melody and harmony. Um, interestingly, um, both uh, perspective and harmony came in with the Renaissance and went out with the 20th century. And language would become, I hope, not too much like mine, diffuse, excessive, and lacking in concrete reference. There'd be deliberate undercutting of the sense of awe or wonder, which would just be mysterianism, um, which it doesn't compute, as it were, to the left hemisphere. Flow would be, as I say, a sum of an infinite series of pieces. We've discarded tacit form of know forms of knowing in favour of what the top will presciently soil as the future of America, a network of small complicated rules that would finally strangle society. And we would see ourselves as Descartes proudly announced that he was more a spectator than an actor in the world. And all this would be accompanied by a dangerously unwarranted optimism. <laughs> now, um, I'm presenting that because that's all I've got time to present. There's an enormous amount more. It will seem very glib like this. The book is substantial and you can go over it in your own time and find the material for references and see the evidence from which I make these very broad deductions. But the thing I just want to say is, to my concluding remark is, I'm not suggesting that the brain somehow drives culture. I'm not suggesting that we are our brains. But I'm suggesting that there are constraints to our thinking which are molded by these two ways that for evolutionary reasons we mustn't be aware of having. We have to fuse them. Otherwise we would be a mess. We wouldn't survive. So we're taking in these two versions of the world. And it's only when we stop and reflect, when we do philosophy, or we start talking as a culture about big ideas, that we start thinking in one or the other way, because we want to construct a system that is internally coherent, but doesn't actually look out of the window where porcupines are not monkeys, or weren't when I last looked. <laughs> Thank you.